getting a clean look at what you own is very, very important to set the stage for how much volatility and what expected rate of return that retiree or pre-retiree should have, understanding what changes they need to make when they switch from being an accumulator to being somebody who's living off of that pool of assets. Strategies to cope on Consuelo Mac Wealth Track. Funding provided by ClearBridge Investments, First Eagle Investments, Royce Investment Partners, Matthews Asia, Strategus Asset Management, and Women Investing in Security and Education. Hello and welcome to this edition of Wealth Track. I'm Consuelo Mack. Soon to be retirees and retirees are the most vulnerable in this new era of higher inflation, interest rates, volatile markets, and possible recession. What kinds of adjustments should they be making in their financial plans, investments, and even lifestyles? Well, that demographic is one of the specialties of this week's guest. An award-winning financial planner, he is Mark Cortazzo, Senior Vice President and Financial Advisor with the Wealth Enhancement Group, an independent financial planning firm he merged his Macro Consulting Group with in 2021. Cortazzo founded Macro Consulting, an independent investment advisory firm, in 1992. He has received numerous awards and accolades. Forbes has recognized him as one of America's top wealth advisors for five years. He has also been named a Barron's top advisor for 12 years, among many other recognitions. We are delighted that he has been a frequent WealthTrack guest since our 2005 inception. Over the years, we've discussed preparing for the increasing incidence of black swan events like the global financial crisis, pandemics, lockdowns, and wars. We've talked about alternative income strategies, transferring equity risk, and how timing can dramatically change retirement outcomes. We began this conversation with what he is telling clients about the new financial realities. The uh, conversations we're having with clients about some of the recent changes and the new financial era that we're in you know, are driven around inflation, obviously, has uh, been a hot topic. And you know, there are parts of people's lives that they have some protection against that. They may own hard assets like uh, real estate. They you know, may get a raise from their Social Security. Um, but outside of that, making sure that their purchasing power is protected is, is very important for, for a retiree. Um, you know, the recent reset in interest rates has helped people who have been drawing income. Um, you know, simple example, somebody who bought a one-year treasury a year ago and had a million dollars in it. They were earning one-tenth of one percent. So on a million dollars, they were earning a thousand dollars interest. The, the current interest rate on a one-year treasury is two percent a little bit over. And so that $1,000 a year of interest has now grown to $20,000 a year interest. So, you know, significantly more than their, their percentage increase in costs. Um, but long term, if we get persistent inflation, they, you know, there's going to be things that need to get adjusted in their portfolio to address that. What about the possibility of recession? Is that something that clients are asking you about or that you're talking to clients about? Yeah, it, it, it is um, because it's all over the media. And, uh, you know, the interesting thing is we went back the last 50 years to you know, look at recessions and how the stock market did during recessions. And half of the time the stock market went down during the recession and half the time it didn't. So, um, you know, there's the concern and then there's the impact. And so sometimes the obvious assumption isn't what the actual data supports. And so it is not uh, something that we are disregarding, um, but it is something that we have to put in context its impact on, on the client's long-term you know, goals and objectives and portfolio. What are you telling them about inflation? So we've been chatting with clients about inflation for the last several years, even when it you know, wasn't a topic and it wasn't uh, you know, cool to be discussing. And so we own things like tips and we own things like gold um, that have fared very well recently. And you know, the, the, the problem is getting in, in those things before it's obvious that you know there's a problem or an issue, uh, because once everyone knows that it's a concern or a risk, the things that protect you against that have already been uh, you know the price of those has already been adjusted. Um, right, expensive. Right. Yeah. Right. So being properly diversified, where you have things that 
benefit from an inflationary environment, even when it's not likely or obvious that we're going to have one, is part of a, you know, a appropriately diversified portfolio. But when you have year after year of them underperforming and the stock market roaring and, you know, having protection is, uh, you know, seems lame or boring, um, you know, it's usually at that maximum point of pessimism or frustration is when they're, they, they, they provide the most value to people because they've just been so mispriced because of expectations. And, and were you reaching that point with the inflation protection with oh. Your clients? Oh, of, of course. I think, I, you know, I, this is uh, 15 years ago is the first time I've done your show. And I went back and looked at a few. And, you know, we've, we've talked about this, this perfect indicator of when we have five clients call in a week about a topic, you know, it's either the beginning or the end of, of the turn on that. And, you know, people not wanting gold because it's, uh, you know, it's not applicable anymore. There's cryptocurrency and, uh, you know, inflation was going to be non-existent because of globalization. And so, um, you know, those, when it's so improbable, you're not paying very much for that protection. And when you get something that's unexpected that happens, which happens all the time, uh, you, you know, um, that's when these things really kick in and can provide a lot of value. Unfortunately, it's not consistent. It usually doesn't add value, doesn't add value, doesn't add value. And then in one year, you'll have 50% of the five years performance occur. And so um, it's important to have them as part of your portfolio, but it's frustrating and requires a lot more patience to own them as part of your portfolio. You mentioned rising interest rates because we do know that the Fed is going to continue to raise interest rates. Right. Um, and if you're in a rising interest rate environment, do you want to, you know, take a chance? Do you need to take the risk of going out longer term in maturity? So uh, also interesting, if you go back and look uh, when short term interest rates rise, 50% um, of the time, long term interest rates decline. So that rise in interest rates can actually take future growth out of the economy. There's about $10 trillion worth of treasuries and tips that will be rolling over in the next three years, almost half of the outstanding treasuries. Um, you have a 200 basis point increase to interest rates, a 2% increase to interest rates on that block of money. Um, it's about $200 billion worth of additional expenses that the United States government has to carry that debt. That's a lot of stimulus that comes out of the economy. That's a lot of growth that comes out of the economy just to service debt. So short-term rates going up does not always necessarily mean that long-term rates will go up. Um, it can actually have the exact opposite effect, and it's not intuitive. How are you handling this rising interest rate environment? So if we build a ladder for our client, and we've built this for a number of clients through all types of environments. And explain, because that is something that you've been using, the bond ladders. Explain how yeah. that works. So, so you, you buy a one-year maturity, a two-year maturity, a three-year, going out to five years, six years, seven years. And if rates go up, you have some money coming due each year, and you would reinvest at that higher rate. If rates stay stagnant, typically you're getting paid more to go out longer on the yield curve or having a longer maturity. And if rates do come down, you've at least locked in some of the money at a higher interest rate. It is not trying to outsmart the market and be perfect. It is trying to hedge the risk of rates going up or rates going down and having, you know, if you buy a bond and you hold it to maturity and it doesn't default, I know what the total return on that's going to be from the day you buy it to the day you sell it. And so having a rolling maturity um, really smooths out those bumps in, when rates move. I mentioned in my introduction to you that one of your specialties uh, is a, a demographic of pre-retirees, people who are close to retirement, and those who are retirees. And you know, we've discussed on several shows in the past um, how timing can really affect the outcome of your retirement. Do you want to explain why timing is so important? And also, it would strike me that now is not a good time to be a pre-retiree or a retiree because you've seen assets across the board uh, except for the you know the the, the few that you mentioned um, that you know the inflation hedges uh, have declined pretty precipitously I think that this is a very very uh difficult time for someone to be retiring. We have, you know, we have rates, you know, have come up a bit, which is good, um, but they're still relatively low. Um, we have had some readjustment of 
uh, the price earnings ratio of the S&P. So stocks are a little bit less expensive, um, but there's a lot of geopolitical risk. There's a lot of you know things that could uh, derail the markets again. So right. understanding what you own is a theme that you've talked about for decades in on this show. When rates were at zero, people tried being cute and buying things that you know there was a good story behind. It is amazing when we have a new prospective client come in, we do an analysis of their existing portfolio. They tell us their risk profile and we look at what is actually in what they own. Um, and it is a, a very eye-opening experience for them. You know, the duration that they have, the credit quality of their fixed income, concentration in certain sectors or areas on the stock part of their portfolio because they bought things that have done well recently, which you know, tends to get them to cluster and be more concentrated in areas. Really getting a clean look at what you own is very, very important to set the stage for how much volatility and what expected rate of return that retiree or pre-retiree should have, which drives understanding what changes they need to make when they switch from being an accumulator to being somebody who's living off of that pool of assets. How do you take a portfolio like that and, and tweak it or readjust it? What, what are some of the things that you would advise someone to do? So on the fixed income side, one of the things we right. often find is that people have a lot of lower credit quality bonds. They may have things that are leveraged. Uh, so the, w when you see changes in interest rates, you know they were doing things to enhance the yield because the yields were so low. And that works great until it doesn't. And um, you know, so those are some of the things where they may have gotten a little bit of a ding, but getting out before we have a recession and, and default rates go up, or if we do see rates continue to rise, you know, understanding what the impact on that is going to be. So if that's supposed to be the safe part of your portfolio, you need to make sure and understand that it's gonna be there during the storm. And often what we're seeing with clients is that the, their safe assets have historically had very high correlations in bad markets. So you know, there's no protection, there's no port in the storm. And that is, um, important to fix before the storm. You still have time to fix before if we have a storm, i.e. a recession. There's still time Correct. now. Correct. And, and you know, going to, going to better quality, um, you know, shortening up maturities, making sure that, you know, you look at some of these investments and how they did in, in 08 or the last time we saw rising mm -hmm. interest rates, if they've been around during that period. So, you know, there's, there's simple things that you can do to test a thesis on what's likely to happen and if the improbable happens, what the impact will be. So, you know, proactively, what can we do? I mean, in addition to shortening maturities in our bond portfolio and actually and trading up to higher quality? Well, the, the first thing is, is uh, you know, always a constant, and that is control the things that you can control. So looking at your expenses, looking at where you have sources of income, when you are looking to trigger those, you, you've done great shows on maximizing Social Security benefits, and that is a really important inflation-adjusted check that retirees get. It's a very rare you know, uh, contributor to their retirement income. Um, uh, looking at where you own what you own, uh, you know, so looking at tax efficiency, if you've got, you know, qualified assets and non-qualified assets, um, not understanding the tax and, uh, efficiency of, of both of those different pots of money, um, you can end up with much less net after taxable income um, by owning it in the wrong asset class. Looking at what are your short-term needs, your intermediate-term needs, and your long-term needs. Make sure that you've got money allocated specifically for those, um, because then you can wait out volatility in the market with your long-term money, knowing that you've got dedicated assets for, for these other shorter and intermediate-term needs. One of the strategies that, that you've talked about uh, several times on WealthTrack, and that you said is, is really the underestimated and how important it can be, is transferring equity risk. Can you explain what you mean by that and how you do it? Sure. Um, you know, we, we educate our clients about you can avoid risk, you can manage risk, and you can transfer risk. You know, avoiding risk was really difficult, uh, you know, in recent uh, years because rates were so low. They were basically zero. So, you know, it was safe, but you weren't earning anything. The good news is your risk-free rate of return on one-year paper right now is, is you know, 
two percent, which is not nothing. You know, it's it's actually can move right. the needle a little bit. Transferring equity risk. Uh, you know, most people are familiar with managing risk, buying bonds and and other asset classes that have lower correlation. Um, but transferring risk uh, is something where, um, like, there's there are uh, buffered ETFs that are traded daily. They're you know they trade just like every other ETF, but they have a, a finite you know, uh, observation period. Uh, and I'll give you an example. You can have a, a one-year ETF where they're buffering the initial decline of the market of, let's say, 15%. So it, you buy it today, a year from now, the market's down 10%, 12%. You get all your money back. If the market's down more than 15%, you would only participate in the amount that it's down more than 15%. So it's down 20, you're only down 5%. So gives you some very nice protection against a downturn in the market. And the upside to it is capped as a result of having this protection. But you know, there, a recent issuance of this, the cap was at north of 14%. So if the market's up 10, you get 10. If it's up 15, you get capped out at 14. I think most people would be pretty happy with a 14% rate of return on their equities over the next 12 months. So, you know, it, it provides you some very nice upside. And if you go back and look at since the inception of the S&P 500, you know, back to the 50s, um, there's been 18 years where the S&P has been negative. 14 of them would have been completely protected by this 15% buffer. So there's only four years where you would have had a negative experience, but you know, just to give you a benchmark right. of how often that 15% covers all of the downside of the market, if you don't mind giving up some of the upside, um, which many clients you know, are more concerned about return of their principal than return on their principal, these, these strategies can be very effective relative to a balanced portfolio or a traditional risk management strategy. Mark, speaking of buffering, your one investment recommendation for a long-term diversified portfolio involves buffering. It's the uh, Innovator U.S. Equity Power Buffer ETF. That's what it's called? Correct. So I think that having equity transfer as part of your portfolio is, is, should be part of everyone's portfolio. This is a great point-in-time example. What are the, some of the hidden risks in the market right now, do you think? I think that uh, growth assets that you know are you know, long dated, if we continue to see interest rates rise, um, can be under a lot of pressure. Uh, you know, if you look at 2001 and 02, we had growth assets three years in a row have double digit losses, um, and we had an entire decade where where growth assets right. were the down. The last decade, the 2000s. But, uh -huh. but, but for growth, it was even worse. Uh, you know, if you had a million dollars in the in in growth assets in January of 2000, a decade later, your your value of your investment was about 750 grand. So in in real like in absolute terms, not including right. the impact of of lost purchasing power on inflation. I think that the price to perfection asset classes are still at risk. You know, this is not a major bear market for them. And um, not saying get out of them. I'm just saying don't be overweight them. Are you talking about the fangs, for instance? You can have great companies that, you know, get very rich in valuations that I love the company, but I wouldn't buy the stock at, the, at those prices. Right. You know, we, uh, we, we run a dividend portfolio for, uh, for over a decade. Um, you know, the, the you know, down years were, you know, were tiny losses, you know, when the S&P was down 15% earlier this year, our dividend strategy was down about five. So, you know, they hold up better. We've bought great companies in there at good prices. We owned a Microsoft when it was really cheap. Um, so, you know, it's not a matter of the company, it's what are you paying for it? What's your advice to somebody who might have been at the tail end of the last bull market? And they're sitting now probably with losses. So uh, when clients come to us, particularly with concentrated positions, um, I think the first question that you have to ask is, would you buy that today? Would you buy that stock today? Because there's a lot of recency bias, and then there's a lot of, um, you know, there's people who bought stocks at great prices and had them run up, and they've given half or three quarters of that gain back. And, you know, they, they don't want to give up or they don't want to lose or, you know, they've got that, that, that point where the stock was, you know, at $100 and now it's at 30 and I don't want to sell it now. It's a $100 stock. It's not. 
It's a, it's a $30 stock. Ask yourself, why wouldn't I want to buy this if I were investing this amount of money today? And I think you make better decisions and clearer decisions. And it doesn't really matter what you bought it at. This is what it's priced at today. And is that a good deal or not? And would you buy it if you didn't have some of these biases? But for retirees, what's your advice to kind of get them through uh, a situation like this where, again, we've had this broad sell-off in multiple asset classes? I think having an analysis of what they own is very important. You know, just blindly saying, I'm a long-term investor, I'm in it for the long haul, um, is not, you know, prudent. If you wipe the board clean and I gave you the $2 million that's in your portfolio, would you build it the way that it is today? If the answer is no, then you should reevaluate your portfolio. If, if it is yes, great. What kind of rebalancing should we be doing? You know, what are the assets that look attractive? Well, I think value is, has been, uh, you know, um, neglected or underappreciated. Uh, and, and underperformed. <laughs> and, under, and, and, yeah. and underperformed. Yeah. Um, you know, it's interesting if you go decade by decade, um, you know, the, the fund companies and the funds that did very, very well, uh, you know, going into, you know, in the 80s, you know, are, are the ones that didn't do as well in the 90s. And right. so relative valuations are important. And, and looking at, um, so I think value stocks are, are well positioned. They're, they've, they've held up much better um, you know, down a third of what the S&P is down, um, you know, and, and, and a, a well-managed uh, value portfolio the last decade's done teen percentage performance mm -hmm. with milder drawdowns, and it's holding up better in this environment. So um, international stocks, uh, you know, just anecdotally, if you go look every decade, every other decade, U.S. stocks, you know, there's the MSCI All World X the U.S., if you compare that to the S&P 500, every other decade, the other is the winner. So U.S. outperforms the next decade. The international outperforms this past decade. U.S. outperformed, you know. Uh, so, the, so the MSCI XUS, yeah. the big right global benchmark, uh, should outperform in this decade. But there are certainly a lot of headwinds there, uh, there, for there the rest are. of the world. Uh -huh. There are, there are, but you're also paying a lot less for a dollar of earnings. Like I yeah. said earlier, you know what what you pay for something matters. And you know if if I'm buying a global company, you know that that 80 percent of their sales is outside of their 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 country that they're domiciled in, and they're making a dollar a share, and they happen to be in Germany versus being in the United States, and I'm paying a 50 percent premium for that same industry, for that same type of company, just because it's domiciled in the United States. You know, I think at some point, you know, you're going to see some reversion to the mean with those. Mark, if we go into a recession, you th think that there are reasons that it will be less severe than, let's say, the recession of 08 and 09 in the global financial crisis. Why? Uh, if you go to 2007, rolling into the crisis, uh, the amount of equity that people had in their homes was less than 50%. Um, right now, it's at about 70 or a little bit north of that. So we have a lot more equity in people's primary asset, which is their home. Um, so that, that provides a lot more staying power. And the amount of cash, uh, the M1 money supply right now is at all time highs or very close to all time highs. So there's a lot of dry powder that if we do get a dip, if we do have a downturn, that there's a fair amount of liquidity that can support that. Those are reasons to be optimistic. What are you really worried about? I'm worried about uh, people making uh, rash decisions. So, you know, uh, bailing on, uh, on equities, you know, trying to time the market. Um, you know, the market is going down is something that we often hear. Um, that's not a true statement. You know, the market went down. You're assuming that it's going to continue, and that may or may not be true. And so, you know, there's a lot of recency bias that causes people to project forward what's currently happening, and that can really cause you to make bad decisions. Words of wisdom from you, Mark Cortazzo. Thanks so much for joining us once again on Wealth Track. It was a pleasure being here. Thanks so much, Consuelo. At the close of every Wealth Track, we try to give you one suggestion to help you build and protect your wealth over the long term. This week's action point is automate as many investment decisions as you can. 
Automation means the discipline of saving, investing, or rebalancing is taken out of your hands and will happen regularly and on schedule. You can automate payroll deductions into a 401k or other retirement account. Same with triple tax exempt health savings accounts if they are available to you. In 401ks, more companies are offering target date funds where investment and asset allocation decisions are made automatically by the fund's management. There are automatic contribution plans for 529 education funds for yourself, children, or grandchildren. Index funds offer one-stop portfolio diversification. Life is complicated enough as it is. Simplifying some important financial decisions will help you achieve your goals and free you up to take care of other things. Next week, investment legend Charlie Dreyfus on his successful winning by losing less. In this week's extra feature, Mark Cortazzo tells us about his decision to merge with another much larger financial planning firm. Please follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and our YouTube channel. Thanks for spending time with us. Have a relaxing weekend and make the week ahead a healthy, profitable, and productive one.